Hi guys, today we're going to be talking about higher order logic, what it is, what it means, and how it gets used in logic, in linguistics, and in metaphysics. So what do we mean by higher order logic? Well, lots of people are familiar with first order logic. The first order bit there means that our quantifiers are quantifying over things, the X in FX, okay? So over people and rocks and chairs, objects, basically, particulars. Then we've got second order logic. Here, we've got quantifiers that quantify over the predicate position. So you can think of that as meaning quantifying over the properties and relations. Okay, so this sentence might mean for any property, if A's got that property, then B's got that property too. Okay, you don't have to read it in terms of properties, but it's kind of what's going on in second order logic. We've moved up a level from the objects to the properties of the objects or the ways that they are. OK, go up another level. We're now talking about third order logic and we're talking about properties of properties. So things like red is a color. OK, I'm applying a property being a color to a property being red. Red is a color. So a sentence like this here, we've got a third order quantifier. This is a property of properties. So what this is saying is there is some property of properties, like, I don't know, being a good property such that for any property, if it's one of those, like if it's a good property, then A and B don't differ. So this might reflect a situation where A and B share all their good properties, but maybe they differ in their bad properties or you know something like that. So here we've got some specific levels of logic, first order, second order, third order. Type theory gives us a way of going up the orders or up the type hierarchy, up as high as we want to go. OK, so arbitrarily high. OK, so to understand higher order logic, logic that can work at any order, any level, we need to understand a little bit of type theory. So type theory is, like the name says, a theory of types. So to understand it, we need to know what we mean by types. And the best way to get a grip on that is through some really simple examples. Let's talk about the natural numbers. Call that nat. That's going to be the type we're interested in in this example. OK, so zero, one, two, they are all objects of type nat. OK, now think of the kind of functions that we can do on those objects. So we've got the successor function or the plus one function. So that's a function that takes in one natural number and it gives us back a natural number. So it's got the type nat to nat. OK, we're going to write it like this to mean it's a function whose input is a natural number and its output is a natural number. OK, pretty simple there. We've also got the addition function. OK, what's its type going to be? Well, that takes in two natural numbers or a pair of natural numbers and spits out another natural number. So we can say it's got this type from a pair of natural numbers. We'll write that like that to a natural number. But there's another way of thinking about it. OK, rather than thinking of it as taking in two natural numbers at once or a pair of natural numbers. We can think of it as first taking in one natural number and returning another function from a natural number to a natural number. OK, often when we do type theory, we're going to consider functions like this. So this is sometimes called the curried form of that function. It always takes in one input, but it gives us back another function, which maybe takes in one input and gives us back another function until we get the output. We should call this a function from natural numbers to functions from natural numbers to natural numbers. But let's just abbreviate that to it's a function from natural numbers to natural numbers to natural numbers. And it basically means the same as from a pair of natural numbers to a natural number. I've got a much longer video on type theory going into its relation to lambda calculus, computer science, logic, linguistics. You can find that linked up here. Kind of what we've been doing implicitly in these logics is saying, here's a predicate and it's taking an individual variable and here's a quantifier and it's quantifying over individual variables and here's a second order quantifier. It wants a second order variable and here's a third order quantifier. So we're kind of defining these implicitly with types, 
by saying what kind of thing does it want as input and what kind of thing does it want as output. So if we do that in a completely general way, we use type theory and then we can have logics of any type or any order. Let me give you an example of one particular higher order logic. So this is from Galen 1975. It's called TY2. OK, so to define it, first of all, we define the types. So we're going to have three base types. We've got E for individuals. We've got S for in effect, possible worlds or world time pairs, kind of ignore that for the time being. And we've got T, the truth values like we had before. And the complex types of the theory are just the ones that we saw before. So you give me two types, alpha and beta, and I can put them together in a new type. So we're, we're just writing this to mean the type from alpha to beta. Sometimes we write it without the arrow, basically just to save space on paper. So that's the types. What are the terms of the logic look like? Well, we've got constants of each type, variables of each type. We've got lambda abstractions and we've got applications, just like in the simply typed lambda calculus. We're also going to be able to form a term A is identical to B whenever we've got two terms at the same type. OK, so we've got identities not just between objects like I am the person talking on this video right now, but also between like properties. So saying that, you know, being triangular is the same as being trilateral. So we've got the ability to form identities for any type. OK, that's quite a novelty of higher order logic. We've also got a special type, things that are of type T, like the sentences. They are the formulas and we are going to apply logical operations to them. So negation, conjunction, disjunction and universal quantification. In more complex type theories or higher order logics, we might be allowed to apply some or all of these operations to things of any type. So like if you say, you know, me and you, that is a conjunction applying to individual terms. We're not doing that here. We're only applying the logical operators to sentences, just like we do in standard logic. That kind of keeps everything a little bit simpler. OK, what does all this stuff mean? Well, we give this logic a semantics and the, the way we do that is through frames. OK, frames is just a way of assigning the terms of the uh, logic to basically functions. So a frame is a set of sets. We're going to have one set D alpha for each type alpha. Really, these can be anything we want as long as those two aren't empty and the domain of the truth values has to be the truth values. So zero and one or true and false or whatever you want to call them. And then for each complex type alpha beta, we want that to be a set of functions from domain alpha to domain beta. So we're interpreting the terms of a complex type from alpha to beta as functions from the domain of alpha to the domain of beta. So the, the domains kind of run in lockstep with the definition of the types. And then on top of this, we give a truth definition, which tells us when these sentences are going to be true or not. So we inherit all the stuff we know and love from standard logic. So, for instance, a conjunction, it's true. Uh, well, it's just the minimum of A and B. So it's true when both A and B are true and it's false otherwise. But we also have to give denotations to the other terms, the lambda abstracts and the applications. Applications are easy, right? Because if we're applying A to B, A has got to be a function. And B is going to be an argument that we can put into that function. The type system guarantees that. So how do we interpret A applied to B? Well, we just apply function A to input B. Easy. So what is the denotation of a lambda abstract going to be? Well, we want it to be a function. We want this to be a function that takes in things of type and gives us back something in the domain of the type of whatever A is OK. So this is going to be the function such that if you put in any D from the domain of A, it's going to give you the denotation of A. OK, that is quite a mouthful. But if you work your way through that definition, it's basically just saying it's the function it should be. It's the function from things of type alpha such that you put in any one of those things in and it's going to give you back the, the denotation, the meaning of A relative to that input. I am being a little bit sloppy here because A might have some free variables in it, in which case we have to substitute into it. But, you know, rather than going into the whole business of variable assignments and that, 
let's just leave it as, you know, it's the function that we kind of expect it to be when we do a lambda abstraction. OK, so this is not the only way to do higher order logics. There are loads of different varieties, but this gives a sense of how we can come up with a very well defined logic using type theory. In some ways, modern compositional semantics just is applying type theory and possible world semantics to natural language. OK, so they're, they're, these theories are kind of so closely intertwined. Let me just give you a few examples here just as a flavor. So let's think about how quickly might work, what its meaning might be. It's not really working like our property of a property example that we had earlier, right? So red is a color. Really what it's doing is it's taking a predicate and it's transforming it into a new predicate, okay? So taking a predicate like runs, which is something I can do, and it's transforming it into a new predicate, runs quickly, which is something I might do or not do, okay? This is called a predicate functor. It's something that takes one predicate and gives us back a new predicate. So it's got this type, okay? It's taking in a predicate, something from individuals to truth values, and it's giving me as output something from individuals to truth values. So the input might be runs and the output might be runs quickly, okay? Something that applies to me is false, but applies to a speedy person is true. So then we can analyze a, a more complex sentence like runs quickly and gracefully, not something I do, like this. So here we've got one predicate functor, an adjective. Here we've got another. And we've got this dummy variable here. We can lambda abstract on it. And that gives us a, a, a one place predicate, something from individuals to truth values. And it's going to apply to people who run quickly and gracefully. OK, so we've got a predicate formed from these predicate functors. And a nice thing here we can do is we can use the deductive power of type theory of type lambda calculus to beta reduce. OK, so if we take this predicate and we apply it to Anna, this will reduce to the sentence Anna runs quickly and Anna runs gracefully. So we've got this nice kind of equivalence between applying the predicate to an individual and just the straightforward sentence in which we're expressing each of those conjuncts of Anna. There's a more general reason why people working in contemporary formal semantics really love type theory, type lambda calculus. And that is because it meshes in a really nice way with the way people look at syntax, OK? So if we take some sentence, we want to be able to analyze its syntax and then, as it were, pass that over to the semantics people to, to analyze its meaning. So this kind of approach to semantics, formal semantics or compositional semantics comes from Richard Montague in the 50s. OK, so it's sometimes called Montague grammar. It was really developed by Montague in a couple of papers. He died pretty early, but then it was taken up by people like David Lewis. He introduced it to philosophers and then it's been developed by a whole bunch of linguists and philosophers, notably by Barbara Party. In the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years or so, you've started seeing lambdas cropping up in philosophy papers. Kian Dorr had this very influential paper, To Be an F is To Be a G, that basically used type theory to analyze these kind of locutions. I wrote a paper back in, I don't know, 2011 or 12 about states of affairs that kind of used type theory. And basically there's been an explosion of people using type theory in metaphysics. So higher order metaphysics is the idea of basically using higher order logics, higher order quantification to address traditional metaphysical issues. So one way we can do that is we can be really clear about the distinction between first order quantification over individuals, second order quantification, which you might think of being over properties, propositional quantification over you might say over propositions, but essentially it's allowing us to quantify into sentence position. So what is the philosophical import of this? Well, think about those age old metaphysical disputes like over properties. What are properties? Do they really exist? Are they platonic, located nowhere in space and time, but really existing? Or are they Aristotelian, somehow multi-located in space and time? Or are they kind of just like nominalists say in words or in thought, having no real existence beyond that? Well, the 
defender of higher order metaphysics might say all of this way of talking is a mistake. OK, because to say where are properties, are they in space or not, is to kind of confuse this kind of quantifier, the quantifier over properties, with this first order quantifier. OK, when we're talking about things being located, we're talking in first order objectual terms. But it doesn't make sense to apply that kind of quantifier to that kind of thing. They are second order things. Similarly, think about all the debates in philosophy of language about propositions, like do propositions exist? What is their nature? Do they exist, you know, even if we didn't have language or thought or whatever? Well, again, higher order metaphysicians can say that's a mistaken way of thinking because it's confusing this kind of quantifier over propositions with this kind of quantifier over objects. It's trying to turn proposition talk into object talk. And at least according to the higher order metaphysicians, propositions aren't objects. In fact, when I said that's a quantifier over propositions, that's probably a bad way of talking because that makes it sound like it's a quantifier over some kind of object. This quantifies over things, but this is doing something else. And then you might say, well, what's it doing? And what defenders of higher order metaphysics tend to say is, well, you have to learn what these things mean by using the logic. OK, maybe we shouldn't even read this as saying there exists an X. It's its own locution that you learn about by learning how to use the logic. I'm not saying this is the right way to think, but it's a way of thinking that has become very, very influential in contemporary metaphysics. If you want to go deeper into type theory and its relation to computer science, to linguistics, to logic and philosophy, take a look at that longer video I've got on type theory linked up here somewhere. If you would like to see more in-depth content like this, you can buy me a coffee over on Ko-Fi or sign up there as a subscriber. If you've enjoyed watching this, do me a favor, hit that thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. That really helps me out. If you've got any questions about this content, leave me a comment down below. I'm going to try to respond to all of them. Thank you so much to all my Ko-Fi supporters for making this content possible and to you guys for watching this far. I really appreciate it and I hope to see you back on Philosophy soon.